we all carry two copies of each. So you get one from your mom and one from your dad. And you have two copies of each chromosome and that's what, where all the genetic, all the, uh, genetic material lives in your cells. Now on each chromosome, there are many genes. So if we look at this gene, it's green here, in the yellow chromosome, and we expand it, we can see the gene is actually quite big, and it itself is comprised of DNA, and DNA is made up of those few letters of the genetic code. So there are only four letters, a C, G, and a T, and an A, that make up every gene. Uh, so that, again, we're, we're gonna go through this relatively quickly, and you know, some of you, this is old hat, some of you, this is like totally confusing, uh, but take it at whatever level you can. Um, you know, it, it ends up being really, really, really important and critical for us in terms of identifying novel, novel approaches, novel treatments. And so this is what we're looking for when we work with you to identify where the genetic changes in you or your family that uh, causes the, the uh, neuropathy. And the, the, this can be inherited, it can be sporadic. I should have put that on here. So it means that it just popped up in that one individual, it's not gonna affect anybody else in the family. We all get a few sporadic changes when we're created, that we have a few changes that neither our mother or our father carried, and we just, there are a few extra little, little uh, twists in there. Uh, but it can be inherited dominantly, it can be inherited recessively, or X-linked I'm gonna skip over. Um, and there are different ways that we can see that in the family. So this is important because when it comes to treatment, we're gonna treat it in a different way. Okay, so dominant inheritance means that everybody who gets that gene, that genetic change, is gonna have the neuropathy. So if one of your parents has this, and this is common, this is true for CMT1A. So in CMT1A, that's a dominant condition. It also is de novo, some families never had it and now they get it all of a sudden in one individual. But once you have it, you can pass it on to your kids. And so in this instance, remember, the uh, father passes on one of his chromosomes to all of his kids. So there's a 50-50 chance that he'll pass on the one without the genetic change or the one with the genetic change. And each of his children who receives the genetic change is going to be affected. And so that's what it means by dominant. It means that you, if, you're, if you get that genetic change, you're gonna have the neuropathy. Now it can vary hugely in, gosh, that this is, I, I gotta get rid of that word. Uh, and it has, it has odd, <laughs> odd effects on me when I say it now. Okay, it can vary a lot. And, um, um, uh, in terms of severity. So that it might be that, yeah, your dad had it, I mean, but you hardly ever noticed it. I mean, you all, the only thing you knew was, was that he had trouble fitting shoes. You know, he had a high arch, but man, I mean, you know, he's, he's 78 years old and he's still walking all over San Francisco. He has no issues at all. And here I am, you know, I'm in my mid thirties and I'm, I'm, you know, already using a walker. So it can vary a lot in severity from one generation to the next. It can go the other direction. You know, it can get milder. So it varies a lot from one generation to the next. And we're investigating that. So part of the, of the uh, network that Gilles was mentioning that we've been uh, uh, working on is looking for those modifiers. Why is it that one family member is so minimally affected, whereas another is so markedly affected? Well, we think there probably are some second genetic modifiers in there. So we've, in, we've already recruited more than a thousand in our network, people with CMT1A, and if we measure their effects, we can hopefully look for the, what those genetic modifiers are. And if we can find that you have a particular gene that makes your neuropathy much milder, Wow, that's a, that's a great treatable option. Maybe that'll tell us a different, a different gene that we can manipulate in order to make your neuropathy milder. So that's one of the studies we're doing for dominantly inherited. And this is just a picture of what we mean by dominantly inherited. You'll see members of each generation are affected 
I mean, it's still 50-50. It's not saying that every one of your kids will be affected. It's still 50-50. But, and, and as I said, they might be variably affected, some more than others. But nonetheless, it's dominantly inherited. And we have a whole list now of genes that can be dominantly inherited, another list that are recessively inherited. We've just got many, many, many genes. And I'm not going to go into this, but this is Carly's point. And this is why in our clinic, Carly plays such a critical role. So I personally do not order any genetic testing for patients with CMT. I actually ask Carly to go in and talk with each of them uh, to say, here are the pros and cons about getting the testing done. And so working out with each family, you know, whether it makes sense or not, uh, because, it, I mean, there are a lot of, of implications, and I don't want this just sent off willy-nilly uh, without considering that. And so we have that long discussion as to whether, whether or not it makes sense. Just to look at the other form of inheritance, um, I, I should have said that that dominant inheritance, when you see it, that each person who gets that gene gets the neuropathy, what that's saying is that that genetic change is causing something damaging to the nerve. Okay, there's something increased. That, that gene isn't working the way it normally works. It's causing a new function. It's causing a damaging function. It's causing, sometimes people say, a toxic function. So that it's a, it's, it, the terminology is varied, a gain of function, a toxic gain of function. There's something wrong about that gene. And if we're gonna treat that gene genetically, we gotta knock it out. Okay, we've got to go in there and we've got to knock it out. We've got to get rid of it. Okay, it's causing a problem. The opposite situation presents in what we call in a recessive inheritance condition where your parents in this instance would both be carriers. They have one normal chromosome without a genetic change and one chromosome with a genetic change, but they're fine. They have no symptoms. They have no neuropathy. They're doing great. When they pass on their, when they have kids, getting myself confused here. When they have kids, they're gonna pass on one or the other of their chromosomes. So one of their kids might get zero copies of that genetic change. A couple of their kids might get one copy, but one out of four of their kids, if you work out the odds of this, is gonna get the genetic change from both mom and dad. That individual, will now have an, a neuropathy. Mom, dad, where am I here? Mom, dad, and any of the siblings have no neuropathy, but this one out of, out of the four siblings is gonna have a neuropathy. In this instance, the gene is not causing a new toxic problem. In this instance, it's just that you're missing the normal function of that gene. So in this instance, you're missing something. So in dominant, you have too much of something or damaging something. In recessive, you have an absence of something that you need. So the converse, I mean, there's a difference there. And as you think about this philosophically, how are we going to treat this? That difference becomes important. You can also see that if you have a recessive disorder, if in this instance, mom has a recessive neuropathy and she carries two copies of that gene, she can safely have kids with someone who does not carry a genetic change there and none of her kids are gonna be affected, okay? None, none of the kids are gonna be affected, but they all will be carriers. Again, if you think about this, that's what's gonna happen. They're all gonna end up with one copy of the genetic change, but otherwise they're gonna be fine. They're not gonna have any neuropathy. So they can safely have kids without having to worry about having a, an affected child but each of their children should know, um, if they come to have kids themselves, that, that they are carriers. And this is oftentimes, if we draw out a family tree, what we'll see is there's just one isolated individual in that family that actually carries the, the, both copies of the genetic change and is affected. So that's how we categorize CMT. So we categorize it as CMT type one, if it's a dominantly inherited demyelinating neuropathy, Type two, if it's a dominantly inherited axonal neuropathy. Type four is a recessive condition, can be either axonal or dominant. 
and then I, I left off the, the uh, X-linked. All right, you ready? Are you hand, hanging in there? All right, I'm not exhausting you yet? All right, because now we're going to move on to treatment. Okay, so how can we use this? So we've built this up now. We have our patients that are well cared for. We have, uh, you know, the electrical testing that's allowed us to kind of pinpoint what kind of neuropathy they have. We've worked out what's, what their genetic change is. So how are we going to deal with that? Well, remember that the, the cell body of all nerves is where? In the spinal cord or adjacent to it. All of the DNA is in the cell body. All of the DNA, remember, is in that nucleus. So if you need to fix the DNA in the, in the nucleus of a nerve cell, you got to get something into the spinal canal, spinal cord, or immediately adjacent to it, because that's where all of the nerve cells live that control the nerves. But as I mentioned, life is a little more complicated than that, because the insulation along the nerve is also critical. So each of those insulating myelin cells or Schwann cells along the course of the nerve also has a nucleus and also contains DNA. So if the problem is not in the nerve cell per se, but in the, that, that myelinating cell, that's where you need to get your treatment. Okay, so it, it ends up being important for us to know what it is we're trying to treat. Are we trying to treat the myelin cells or are we trying to treat the nerve cell? Okay, so now if we look at the, at the DNA, we can look at the DNA. Remember, it's the exact same DNA. Every cell in your entire body carries the full encyclopedia of genes. It's, each cell is going to read different parts of that encyclopedia, but they all carry the same information. So we can look at the DNA in the Schwann cell or in the myelin cell, or we can look at the DNA in the nerve cell itself, and it looks the same. So just to talk about this a minute, because it comes back to being important when we get into treatment, I've just drawn two of those chromosomes. Remember, we have 23 copies of any one you have two copies of each chromosome. So if we look at that, as I pointed out before, along that chromosome you have all these different genes. So we have a thousand genes maybe on a given chromosome. On total there might be probably 35,000 genes. So there are a ton of genes along there. But if we look more closely, each of those genes is itself made up of little blocks. So if we look at this, this one gene is made up of these five different blocks. And the reason that's important is because the, the body is very, very clever and it can construct different proteins out of this. So it can actually put together blocks one, three, and five and, and make a different protein than if it puts together blocks two, three, four, and five or blocks one, two, three, four, and five. There's a different way of splicing this together and you get a different protein out of each. Isn't that clever? It's phenomenal. So your body has this way of, of modifying the proteins and that ends up being important. So I'm going to, it's, this is somewhat, it seems rather abstract and detailed, but I'm bringing it up because I want to get someplace. This is all DNA. There's an intermediate which is called RNA. So you might not remember that. But in 10th grade biology, what they talked about was that you have a gene that's in DNA and it encodes a protein. And that's all true. What they oftentimes kind of skipped over was the fact that there's an intermediate that is important just for the reading of it, and that's called RNA. So that the DNA is, is read as RNA and the RNA is read as a protein. Bear with me, bear with me, hang in there, hang in there. You're gonna make it, okay, I know this is kind of too much, but it, it gets spliced together. So there's, there's the final recipe for that gene. So if you want that pink gene to be made, or somebody can come up with a better name for that, salmon gene, I don't know whatever color that is, um, to be made, you have to splice this together. And as I mentioned, you can splice one, two, three, four, and five together. You could splice it differently, but whatever you splice together ends up creating the protein. So now you've got the protein made and life is good. 
Okay, so that's the way this works. Okay, now I'm going to go into a specific nerve problem. So when Mike Shai was with us a few years ago, um, he kind of broadened my horizons and said that, you know, we need to think of, of CMT as being all kinds of different things. So things the old neurologist categorized as something else are really forms of CMT. And so that allows me, that gives me license to talk about this other thing that is oftentimes not referred to as a form of CMT. It's called spinal muscular atrophy, but it's, it's a neuropathy. It's the same kind of thing. It's just that it's isolated in its effects on nerves that go to muscle. It does not affect nerves that go to skin. And it's really quite nasty. So this comes on in infants by age three or four, and they die before they're one or two. So it's a nasty kind of nerve damage, but it's a neuropathy. You want to think about it in realistic terms. This is a neuropathy. Okay, it's a, it's a special type, but it's a neuropathy. So where's its cell body? In the spinal cord. The spinal cord nerve goes out to the muscle, and because of a genetic change I'm going to talk about briefly here, it ends up causing the nerve cells to die, and then the patient to die. And the problem they have is it's a recessively inherited disorder, meaning that they're missing a key protein, right? Mom's a carrier, dad's a carrier, they have no idea they're carriers. One out of four of their kids are born, they look normal at birth, and then by age three to four months, they start to lose strength. And the reason they lose strength is because each mom and dad is missing this one gene. They're missing what's called SMN1. So, okay, so that gene's gone, not there, missing. The fortunate thing for all of these patients is that they carry a second copy. They carry another gene, SMN2. It's like having a spare tire. They just happen to have a spare tire, very cool. The problem is that there's a nail in it. So that there's a nail in the tire, so exon seven here, exon building block number seven, this gene happens to have eight building blocks, and exon number seven literally, well not literally, but I don't know, metaphorically, has, has a nail in it. It doesn't work. It's a flat tire. Great, you've got a spare tire, tough, tough luck, it's flat. It's not gonna help you. So some really, really clever people, and this is what Gilles was talking about. We have the fortune to work with some really, really smart and clever people in this business, came up with a way to patch this tire so that, you, so that yeah, it has that nail in it, but we're gonna figure out how to make it work. And what they did was they came up with this thing, it's called an antisense oligonucleotide. I refer to it as an ASO, don't worry about it too much. It's a synthetic form of DNA, and it's synthetic so that the body can't chew it up. It, it lasts and lasts and lasts and lasts. It's, it, the normal enzymes that chew up th such things don't work on it, and so when you inject it into somebody, it lasts long enough that it can basically seal this hole caused by the nail in, in building block number seven. And lo and behold, you get protein out of it. But where is the cell body? It's in the spinal cord. So where does the antisense oligonucleotide, I've got to come out, ASO, what, ASO, I don't know, somebody come up with a cl more clever name for this, go, it has to go into the spinal cord. How do we get it into the spinal cord? We inject it into the spinal fluid. So if we inject it into the spinal fluid, it's a tiny, tiny, tiny thing. So it penetrates the spinal cords, penetrates the nerve cell, penetrates the nucleus, and sticks. And where does it stick? Only to that nail hole in block seven of SMN, of the SMN2 gene. It's, it's amazing. I mean, this is, this, I mean, literally, I, my, the hair standing up on the back of my neck as I'm saying this, because I find this so incredibly specific, that you can have something that goes in and it only affects that one site. It, it gives, it's just, powerful. And the importance of this is that by changing the sequence of, of where that little bullet is going, we can make it go to different genes. So it goes to this gene now, but you can change the, the letters of the genetic code and then it'll go to a different gene. And so you start thinking about where you want this to go and it can go to any number of different sites. But let's see if it works first before we get worry, thinking about 
too grandiose here in trying to solve all problems in the world. So we inject it into the spinal fluid and it gets into those nerve cells. That brown color in these cells is, is this um, ASO or ASO, getting into where we want it to be. Okay, so shortly after I got here, we treated the very first infant any place with this compound. Um, and uh, I will show you that, but this is a picture of what we saw after 14 months of treatment. Now this isn't a magic wand. It doesn't come down and poof, make all problems go away. But these kids never get better. These kids die of their disease. It's a very, very severe form of nerve damage, which is why we, we are focusing on it, right? Because if we have something that works, we can see very quickly that it works. If we have kids that are gonna get stronger or survive, wow, okay, that never happens. So that's, that's unusual. So these little boxes here, the red boxes are the kids in the later group who got a higher dose. The blue boxes are the kids in the first group, including that very first infant that I mentioned, who got the lower dose, uh, just to make sure we weren't causing any un unexpected problems. And this shows where they were when we first treated them. So all these different things, head control, sitting, voluntary grasp, ability to kick, roll, crawl, stand, or walk. And this shows then after 14 months of treatment, without treatment, all of these little boxes are gonna to move to the left. They're gonna, they're gonna, the kids are gonna lose more and more function. They're not gonna be able to do things. So in terms of head control, going from unable to control their head to having some control and wobbling or being able to maintain normal head control, they're not gonna move in this direction. They're gonna move in this direction. They're gonna lose more function. Okay, here's what we actually saw. Again, I can't, I can't talk about this without getting really, really excited. I've, I've taken care of these kids now for about three decades. I've buried I, countless kids I've worked with. Yep, I'll do it again. So there, there are a couple of squares that move to the left, only blue ones. Only blue squares move to the left. So there seems to be a dose effect. The higher dose does better, but they move to the right. They're gaining function. And I can tell you now that two of these kids, so we treated 24 in total. This will be coming out in a journal called The Lancet in the next few weeks. Um, and it's uh, led to this drug now being uh, submitted to the FDA. This drug will be available for treatment um, the beginning of uh, 2017. All right, so here's, here's our, our you know, really, really brave first patient um, when we first saw her. So this is before any treatment, and if we look at her, you can see that she does not move her legs at all. So it's not like she was normal when we started her on treatment. She's not moving her legs at all. She can barely move her little toes, but she cannot move her legs at all. She can move her arms at the hands and elbows, but she can't move her arms at the shoulders. And she can only sit up here for a little bit of time uh, because uh, sitting up is hard for her because she uh, loses the ability to breathe. So she needs to lie down to be able to breathe. And she was at this age already getting breathing support at night uh, with a, a BiPAP device uh, so that she could uh, do okay. All right, so I to showed you that data at 14 months. So I'm gonna show you what she does at 14 months, being quite confident that without any treatment, she would have, she would have died. I mean, you know, or she, we would have had to have put her a breathing tube in her to breathe for her to keep her alive. And here she is at 14 months. She, she, she doesn't have an eye movement problem. She just keeps staring at me the entire time. I've had to do, the, I've had to do EMGs on her for every, every three months. She doesn't trust me any farther than <laughs> she can throw anything. So she's, she's staring at me the whole time because she, doesn't, she wants to make sure I stay across the room. But there she is, she can lift her legs up. She couldn't do any of that before. 
<laughs> exactly. And here she is at 28 months. I mean, so she's not normal. I mean, she still is weak, uh, but she can sit independently. Uh, she can yell at her baby sister and tell her to get out of the way. Uh, you know, so she's going to throw, throw this to her parents, but the baby sister won't get out of the way, so she keeps yelling at her, tell her telling her to move. Um, and, you know, she's doing quite well. I mean, so bottom line is, I, I think this works. I think it, it uh, works exactly the way we have other data to substantiate that. But it, it goes into the nerve cells, it affects the genes where we want it to, and it ends up correcting this recessive disorder. Now we have another approach for treating dominant disorders. If we want to knock out something that's toxic or causing problems itself, there's a variation on this theme that we can use. And so just to uh, go over that, I mean, um, yeah, th th these are the, the kids that we've treated. And uh, you know, most of them are doing really well. We have had some deaths. Uh, it's not a magic wand. You know, they still have the weakness they have, and if they get pneumonia, they're in trouble. Uh, so that happens. Uh, this accidental death, the parents didn't realize that that baby was strong enough to roll over, and he rolled over when they weren't in the room and suffocated. So it, it's, it, it, that's a horror in and of itself, but it's an important lesson that we need to be really conscious about unintended consequences of these treatments and make sure that we're doing things with our eyes open and supporting them in all ways we can. So bottom line is that understanding genetics has led to novel treatments, as Gilles was, was saying. Uh, we're very excited about where this is heading. Um, we have a number of things that uh, we're able to do now uh, for treating different forms of nerve damage. We're starting a new type of treatment. This is reprogramming a virus to go in and treat the nerves, uh, carrying in the gene that's missing. We'll start that hopefully within the next month or two here at Stanford. It's the first gene uh, virus therapy I've done at Stanford. And um, I, you know, I just had the company up here uh, a couple weeks ago to talk with them and the preclinical studies for CMT1A are moving forward very, very nicely. So we're, we're quite optimistic that we're gonna be able to uh, you know, move this into the CMT world in the near future. So one or the other of these methods. So we think we're developing the methods that should work. So this is again a plug for our, our uh, consortium that if you join us, you know, you get the uh, insights of investigators around the world involved in this and w with that group we're working to develop uh, new insights and treatments for CMT. So final word, so CMT alters nerve function. We do have to use the EMG to help characterize it to some extent. It explains a lot of the symptoms that are going on and gives us an idea of how to optimally care for pe people with CMT but also understanding that genetics is leading us to develop new means of treatment that we're very excited about. So again, I, I'm, I'm sorry, as I said, I'm kind of running on fumes here and probably did not judge myself well and, and gassed on way too much as evidenced by Jennifer being up in the front of the room. So, um, but I just, I'm, I'm excited about it. So thanks for <laughs> indulging me. So, um, 